All right, you guys, welcome back to the last lesson in the series of lessons in which we've been talking about the endocrine system, in particular these disorders which we're often going to find ourselves taking care of within the ICU. The last two of these disorders that we are going to be talking about here today are going to be the difference between our thyroid storm and our myxedema coma. And my name is Eddie Watson, and I'm going to be presenting this last lesson for you today. But before we begin with this, if this is your first time to our channel and watching one of our videos, and you'd really be interested in more of these critical care, in-depth content videos such as this one, then we invite you to subscribe to our channel below. Make sure though that you guys hit that bell notification icon, that way you'll be notified as soon as our new lessons become available to you. I truly value the subscriptions, the likes, and the comments that you guys leave for us. It really goes a long way to help support our channel, and for that, I do want to thank you guys. Alright, so thyroid storm versus myxedema coma. Well, as you can see by the giant thyroid gland that we have here, both of these are going to be disorders that are resulting from an inappropriate level of thyroid hormone. And so before we begin to dive in and talk about these two different disorders, uh, let's talk a little bit about the thyroid gland and in particular thyroid hormone, which it's responsible for secreting. So essentially the thyroid gland is going to release the hormone that we call T4. And T4 gets activated into what we call T3, and this is the active primary form of thyroid hormone. Now both T3 and T4 are extensively bound to albumin. Something like 99% of it is bound to the albumin. And really our thyroid hormone plays an important role throughout our entire body. The two most important things that it does is it controls our metabolism as well as our hormone sensitivity. And like I said, this is a far-reaching hormone that really has its fingers in all areas of our body. And so when we find ourselves in situations where we have an inappropriate amount of this hormone, it can cause all sorts of issues, which we're going to talk about now. Now the first of these that we're going to start off with is something that we call thyrotoxic crisis, or what's commonly referred to as thyroid storm. And essentially, thyroid storm is a severe form of hyperthyroidism. And so here, essentially, we have too much of our thyroid hormone, and this can really lead to a systemic decompensation. And really, if this is left to be untreated in 48 hours, that this can lead to death. So definitely a very serious complication that our patients can find themselves in. And so let's talk about what it is that causes our patients to go in this. So typically it's going to start off with our patients who have either an undiagnosed or an undertreated Graves disease. And so really Graves is an autoimmune disorder and what it does is it causes the thyroid to release too much of the thyroid hormone. And so what we find in these patients is they have some sort of event that happens and this event such as a illness, injury, or even surgery will essentially start a cascade that leads them into this thyroid storm. And so if we talk about this patho of what causes our patients to go into this thyroid storm, there's really a couple theories about the causes. One theory is that it's due to changes in how our thyroid hormone binds to albumin. Another theory is that we see changes in the thyroid hormone receptors on our target tissues. And the third theory is that this is some sort of exaggerated response to sympathetic activity. And so we're not quite sure which one of these or combination of these actually is the determining factor in precipitating our patients into this thyroid storm, but the end result is the same. Due to this excessive thyroid hormone, that we're going to find our patients in a hyperdynamic and hypermetabolic state, and ultimately that this is going to disrupt our major body functions. And so these signs and symptoms that we would expect to see in our patient are going to be a result of this hyperdynamic, hypermetabolic state. 
and this is really characterized by a high fever. And this can be greater than 104 degrees. You're also going to see things like tachycardia, palpitations, and arrhythmias. You could also see altered respirations, tremors, delirium, or even stupor or coma. And so if we move on and talk about how we would diagnose someone with thyroid storm, it's important to know that there's no specific lab test that can really distinguish between this thyrotoxic crisis from a just generalized uncomplicated hyperthyroidism. So we are going to check labs like our TSH, our free T3 and T4 levels, but other than recognizing that our patients have hyperthyroidism and seeing these signs and symptoms, that that's for the most part going to be what we're going to use to make this diagnosis that they're in this thyroid storm. Although there are some studies that show that you may have an undetectable amount of TSH when these patients are in crisis. So we're not going to have any true diagnostic tests that we can do. We're going to need to look at these signs and symptoms as well as these tests that tell us that our patients have hyperthyroidism. So now let's go ahead and move on and talk about our treatment options. So definitely if we know or suspect that our patient is in crisis, they should be managed in the ICU. And our treatment of this is really going to revolve around five main things. First is going to be to inhibit the thyroid hormone production. Next is going to be to block the release of thyroid hormone. Third is going to be to antagonize the peripheral effects of thyroid hormone. And then from there, we're going to provide supportive care. And last but not least, and probably the most obvious, is to treat the precipitating cause of this crisis. So if we go up here and we talk about our inhibiting the production of thyroid hormone, we're going to use these antithyroid medications. And there's really two main ones that we use. The first of these is what we call methamazole, which goes by the name tapazole. And the other is a medication more easily referred to as PTU. Now, PTU is the preferred medication due to its ability to inhibit the conversion of T4 into the active T3 in the periphery. The problem with this is it is a high risk for injury to the liver and possible liver failure. So it is very important to carefully use this medication. Now for the second form of treatment where we want to block the thyroid hormone release, this is mainly because these antithyroid medications don't have an immediate effect. And so what we'll do for these patients is we'll give them some sort of inorganic iodine. And what this is going to do is this is going to block the release of T4 from the thyroid. Now you can also use radiographic contrast, and for patients who have that iodine allergy, we can also give them lithium to do this, uh, but it does have worse side effects. So again, iodine is our first line of choice. So now at this point, we're working to inhibit the production of the thyroid hormone. We've also used the iodine to block the release of the thyroid hormone. And so now we also want to antagonize the effects of thyroid hormone out in the periphery. And so again, because of the inhibition of this production can take sometimes days to even weeks, we really need to block the effects of T3 in order to minimize the injury to the organs, as well as reducing the signs and symptoms of this adrenergic stimulation. And so in studies, they found that our beta blockers are going to significantly reduce the mortality rate in these patients by as much as 20%. Now, of the beta blockers, propanolol is our drug of choice, but you can also use things like esmolol or atenolol. Now, when we talk about providing supportive care, these are going to be things like giving them stress dose steroids, some sort of cooling, either with a cooling blanket or ice packs, as well as the fluid replacement to try and prevent dehydration, uh, especially in patients who have vomiting and diarrhea and just this elevated and sensible fluid loss. 
And lastly, like we said, we want to treat that precipitating cause to prevent our patients progressing back into this state of crisis. All right, so that's our review of thyroid storm. Like we talked about, this is a case of a severe hyperthyroidism that's been precipitated by some sort of illness, injury, or surgery pushing these patients into crisis. We talked about not really knowing exactly how this process works, but that ultimately we're going to see our patients at the high level of thyroid hormone leading to a hyperdynamic, hypermetabolic state causing the signs and symptoms that we see and then talked about the different pillars of treatment for these patients. So now let's move on and talk about myxedema coma. And this really is a life-threatening emergency. And in the case of myxedema coma, on the opposite side of our thyroid storm, that this is essentially a severe hypothyroidism. And so ultimately what we're going to have here is some sort of stressor that's going to increase our body's metabolism, that's going to lead to them depleting the thyroid hormone and ultimately leads them into crisis. Now this is something that we see more often in women as well as the elderly, but it's important to know that this has a mortality rate of anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. So it's a very serious condition if we find our patients in this and it's, like I said, a life-threatening condition. And so let's talk about some of the causes. So like we said, this is going to be in our patients with hypothyroidism with the addition of some sort of stressor. And these precipitating stressors can include things like an infection or trauma. Certain drugs can also cause this. Things like our tranquilizers, barbiturates, and narcotics. And another thing that comes up more often in wintertime is going to be a cold exposure. And so whatever these precipitating stressors are, this leads to an increase in our body's metabolism, thus ultimately depleting the patient's store of thyroid hormone. And so let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms that we'd expect to see in our patients with this myxedema coma. Now we're going to see a hypothermia, and this is going to be as a result of not having this thyroid hormone around leading to this decreased metabolism. And we can see temps in these patients anywhere from 80 to 88 degrees. And when you see this, this really is a grave prognosis for these patients. You could also see hypoventilation, hypotension, bradycardia, hyporeflexia, this is as a result of these slowed neuron conductions. You also are going to see hyponatremia, a generalized interstitial edema. And this is where the term myxedema comes from, is this edematous appearance that you're going to see. And the reason for this is we have these accumulation of intradermal proteins that just pull the fluid out of our vasculature into these interstitial spaces. In these patients, you can also see a depressed consciousness. And this can be part and due to the increase in our patient's CO2 level from that hypoventilation. So now if we look at how we diagnose these patients, and really our diagnosis here is going to be based on our labs and symptoms. So again, we're going to check our thyroid function, things like a CBC and a CMP, you also want to check an ABG on these patients, cortisol level, and possibly even blood cultures to rule out some sort of infection. You may also do other diagnostic studies like a chest x-ray, EKG, perhaps an ultrasound, or a CT of the head. Although these are going to be primarily to rule out other disorders and possibly identify some of the signs. All right, and so lastly, let's talk about the treatment that we have available for these patients. Now, treatment for myxedema coma is really going to involve four things. First is our hormone replacement. Next is going to be to correct our fluid and electrolyte balance. Third will be our supportive care. And last but not least, 
identify and treat the cause. So for our hormone replacement treatment, there is some controversy that exists over using just T4 versus T3 and T4, but ultimately we need to give them this thyroid hormone that they are lacking. Now when we're correcting our fluids and electrolytes, we want to give them fluids if they are hypotensive and possibly using hypertonic saline for their hyponatremia. Now for a supportive care, this is going to really involve the most things that we're doing here. These patients, because of this hypoventilation and decreased consciousness, that they may require intubation and mechanical ventilation. They may also require temporary pacing if they have a symptomatic bradycardia. We do also want to warm these patients, either with warm blankets or a warming device. We're also going to want to provide glucose for them, as well as our stress dose steroids. And this is really going to be to help with our blood pressure as well as our glucose. And then, like I'd already mentioned, we want to identify and treat the cause that precipitated our patients progressing into myxedema coma. All right, so that pretty much covers what we're going to talk about here with myxedema coma. Like I said, important thing to remember, this is life-threatening with a pretty grave mortality rate for these patients. This is a case of a severe hypothyroidism because our patient's bodies are having an increased metabolism, depleting those thyroid stores and leading them into crisis. The signs and symptoms that we're going to see are going to be as a result of this lack of thyroid hormone to their body. And like I said, can be very serious. We don't have any true defining diagnostic criteria for this. We're just going to look at our lab values as well as these signs and symptoms to diagnose them. But when it comes to our treatment, we want to make sure we're replacing the hormone that they don't have. We're correcting any fluid or electrolyte issues that are going on, truly support them through this. And then ultimately we've got to find that cause. All right, so that is going to wrap up this lesson looking at the differences between the thyroid storm and myxedema coma. Two very different disorders on very different ends of the spectrum, but both relating to this imbalance of thyroid hormone. Hopefully with this lesson, this has made things a little bit clearer between the differences between these two and what you would expect to see as well as the treatment options available. And while these aren't very common, again, it is important to have this good foundation of, of knowledge in the event that you do come across a patient that is in one of these crises. And so with that said, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, this is the last lesson in this series on the endocrine system. And I really hope this lesson, as well as all the past lessons, that you guys found the information in there useful, that it helped you to understand what's going on with these different disorders, because these are things that you are going to see in the care of your patients in the ICU. If you did find this video useful, please leave us a like below as well as leave us a comment and let us know what you think. Uh, these really do go a long way to help support our channel in these videos. I'd also like to direct you to check out the last series of lessons that we did in which we talked about heart failure, as well as another real popular video that we have in which we take a look at the basic proper order of draw for the lab tubes. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching. You guys have a wonderful day.